And it can be from, her situation was Lansing to Flint. Now that's only 45 minutes. I mean, I did it for three and a half hours, but I was really proud of her. But anyway, I usually end up asking him if he's mad at me or why he's not talking to me. And he says, he is not mad, but I think surely he must be, for why else would he not talk to me? I'm sure you know the routine. And I thought to myself, yeah, I used to ask Emerson that all the time in our early days. So I conveyed to him what I had learned from you about that, and he said with much relief, see, that's exactly right. Sometimes you need to know you just have a buddy right there beside you. And I thought, well, there's another confirmation that women, we can ride shoulder to shoulder, we can be with them without talking. I think I would have been a better mother to sons if I had learned this sooner, but never too late to begin again, so I'm practicing it now. Back to recreational activities. Do you enter into the things that he likes? Like those things that I bet you did with him when you were dating? Can you watch a game on TV even if you don't like sports? Can you go fishing even if you don't like to fish? Can you ride in a golf cart even if you don't golf? Women, these are things that, you, like I said, you probably did when you were courting because you wanted to be with him. Now, we know there are seasons of life, and you can't do these perhaps as much as you did back then. But wouldn't it be exciting to surprise him? Kind of like my friend did when she heard, had come to the conference and she thought, I don't really know if this is really that powerful, but she thought, you know what? Phil loves to hunt. I'm going to just tell him I'd like to go hunting with him. So she did. And I think after she probably picked Phil up off the floor and had told him she wanted to go hunting, they planned this hunting trip. She told me how they got the deer blind, put it in the truck, they went out to their spot, and she said, we got it out, we walked to the spot, and we put it up, and we got up in there. Now, this woman talks faster than I do, and she talks more than I do. So this is amazing. She said, we got up in there, I zipped my lips, and she said, and we sat there for two hours. We did nothing, we said nothing, and we got nothing. At the end of the two hours, she said, we took the deer blind down, we walked back to the truck, and on the way back to the truck, Phil turned to her and said, Roberta, that was awesome. <laughs> she thought, we did nothing, we said nothing, we got nothing? Ask Phil, it was awesome. All I can say, women, is it works. And I had such a, it was such, so neat this week. My daughter-in-law was, we were talking on the phone, and she said to me, oh, oh, guess what we did yesterday? And I said, what? She said, we went out in the backyard, and Jonathan was teaching me to cast. And they had just come to our conference a couple weeks ago. They went twice before they got married, and then they came in Portland, which is where, near where they live. And I think that she thought, you know what? I mean, Jonathan loves to fish. He's so excited to be in Oregon. In fact, Colorado is one of his other favorite places. He's been here many, many times to fish. And I thought to myself, isn't that neat that she is wanting to learn to fish? Yes. Okay. Lastly, he feels respected when you encourage time alone for him. It does energize him to reconnect later again. He doesn't want you to do those things with him all the time, just ever so often, but he does need to do them alone too whatever it is, fishing, hunting, woodworking, you name it. Lastly, and I'm passionate about this, and don't you think that's a pretty good word for the section on sexuality? A man feels respected when he knows you appreciate his passions and his pleasure, namely his sexual desires, and therefore feels respected when you initiate periodically. And might I add, they love it. You could write that down, women. By initiating periodically, they love it. Next, respond more often. And you could add, positively. <laughs> they love it. Remember how we want them to have eyes for only us, but then we push them away? I am growing concern today for the number of women who know that men are visually oriented before marriage, but somehow forget that after marriage. And they don't make it easy for their husbands to have eyes for only them. A medical doctor came up to us after the conference one time, and he shared with us how Every day, he works with women who always look their best, but when he comes home, his wife, she doesn't have her hair fixed, she doesn't have any makeup on, she has clothes on that really aren't that becoming. And he said, you know, it would just honor me so much if when I came home, I felt like she had wanted to look her best for me. It wasn't like he was wanting her to be in her prom dress, but it was like he said, I always notice when she goes out with her friends, she always looks her best. So women... I grew up on a farm, and I'm reminded of the phrase that says, if the barn needs painting, paint it. You know what? 
you'll feel better about yourself and you'll bring pleasure to your husband. And let me say this, if you don't look your best for him, somebody else might. So you make that your goal, to look your best for him. Another concern I have is reflected in an interview with a well-known TV personality whose husband died a few years ago. And she was interviewed after she began dating. And this is what the interview said. Her newly acquired comfort with dating has yet to be shared by her fourth grade daughter. She asked me to promise that if I ever got remarried, I wouldn't have sex. And I assured her by saying, oh, don't worry, honey, once people get married, that's when they stop having sex. <laughs> and she said, just kidding, just kidding. But when I read that, I thought to myself, that is no joke. I thought it's been said that Satan does everything he can to get us together before marriage and everything he can to get us apart after marriage. I think it's interesting how women still want their emotional needs met after marriage, but somehow lose sight of the fact that their husband has a physiological need. Again, women, this marriage isn't just about us. It's not just about your daughters. It's about your sons and your husband. He created us male and female. Not wrong, just different. A man feels respected when we let him acknowledge his sexual temptations without shaming him or making him feel shamed. My concern is how many men don't feel the freedom to share their struggles with their wives for fear of being put down or being shamed. Women, because we don't struggle in this area, we just do not, I just don't think many of us really understand that someone could have a need that we don't have. Again, women, God made them this way, just like he made your sons. Just as he made us with an emotional need for release, which comes through talking, he made your husband and your sons with a physiological need for release. Just as most men could go a long time without talking, your sons could go a long time without talking, most women could go a long time without sexual intimacy. And I thought one day, you know, Lord, why did you make us so different? And then it just struck me, again, this is about meeting another person's deepest need. He wanted us to think in terms of serving. One, thing, one day I was trying to think how I could best get my point across this because I'm deeply burdened that many men are suffering in this area of their relationship. There are some women, but the majority are men. And um, a young woman came to me who was, um, had been in a group of young godly women, and the issue of sexual intimacy came up. And she told me what this woman said. She didn't tell me who it was because she knew I would... I uh, know who she was, but she knew I was sharing this type of thing in the conference, and she said, Sarah, she said, this issue of sexual intimacy come up, came up, and this one woman said, you know, I just told my husband, I don't have the time, I don't have the energy, and I don't have the desire, so there. I thought to myself, whoa, you know, I didn't feel like fixing my kids' lunch every day, especially when I wasn't hungry, but I did it because I knew they needed it. I had a medical doctor come up to me after the conference, a conference, and he said, he thanked me for sharing this. He said, Sarah, I have women in my office every day saying what that woman said, and I share with them what you shared, so please keep telling the women. And then I told him this story, and he said to me, Sarah, I want you to share that. So this next story, I share by orders of the doctor. I was having my um, yearly checkup, and I was meeting with the nurse practitioner, and I'd met her a couple times before, but this time she asked me what we did, or what I did, and what my husband did, and so I told her, and she said, oh, have I got a story for you. I said, oh, what's that? And she said, oh, my husband and I always go to visit my parents every weekend, like on a Sunday. And she said, but this past weekend, we did not go. I called my mom and said, mom, we're not coming. And she said, well, why not, Beth? And she said, oh, Mark's in a twit. And she said, well, what's Mark in a twit about? And she says, oh, I suppose it's because we haven't been sexually intimate for six or seven days. She said, Beth, you should be ashamed of yourself. She said, mother? And then she said, Beth, why would you deprive him of something that takes such a short amount of time and makes him so happy? <laughs> she said, mother? <laughs> and then she looked at me and she said, you know what? My parents have been married for over 50 years, and I don't know anyone happier than my mom and dad. And I said, and you know what? Your dad is married to a very wise woman, and I'm so thankful she shared her wisdom with you. So, here's my analogy. Women, what if your husband didn't talk to you for three days? What if he didn't talk to you for three weeks? What if he didn't talk to you for three months? What if he didn't talk to you for three years? I think you see 
what I'm trying to say, and I think you would say that's abominable. This is a huge issue. Social science and research shows that it's a huge issue. So women, if you've been looking for a ministry or you just want to bring pleasure to your husband, I'm sure he'd say, start here, go for it. <laughs> now I just want to say this. Women, what about your sons? They've been created just like your husband. Men, what about your daughters? They've been created just like your wives. Again, he didn't make us... He made us male and female. Not wrong, just different, because if one of us is wrong, then that means your son or your daughter is wrong. So as you've gone through this, again, hopefully you've seen the balance that God was trying to bring. I also want to remind you that Ephesians 5.33, again, is a command. There's no neutrality. We either will obey it or we won't obey it. This really is not a crisis of marriage. It's a crisis of faith. This is really a spiritual issue. And as Emerson said last night, who makes the first move? The one who sees himself or herself as the most mature. I just dare you to make the first move because God will bless you as you do. And trust me, he honors obedience. And that's what the rewarded cycle is all about. So I just encourage you to live in anticipation of what God's going to do. It's really the only way to live. Thank you for letting me share. We're going to take a 10-minute stand-up break. Thank you.